Good morning, everyone. Hope you had a good night's rest. We had a wonderful reception last night, uh, and we want to thank Jill and the NEA for this wonderful venue for our meetings today. We're going to start getting into the subjects we're going to be talking to the Congress about when we visit the Hill tomorrow. So it's my pleasure to moderate this morning's session and I would encourage you to uh, pull out your handout on the sustainable development goals. You should have this in your packets. So with a little shuffling of paper, we'll get those out. How this is going to work, I'm going to give a little background on what we've done as an organization and what you have led in your communities, uh, sort of transitioning from the Millennium Goals to the Sustainable Goals. And then I'm going to introduce our panelists, uh, Ambassador Cousins and uh, Mark Schlachter, and they are going to uh, give us more detail of their experience uh, from their uh, their backgrounds and their participation uh, at the UN and at the State Department. And then we'll open it up for questions toward the end of our time together. So that's how this is going to work. Uh, how many of you have participated in a post-2015 agenda event of some kind? Yeah. How many of you have actually led one of those post-2015 agenda events? Wonderful. That's really great. Uh, I am also one of those people. I led two of them in California, uh, helped plan them. I personally led one of them. And uh, Joy Adams, are you with us this morning, Joy? There she is. She led the second one in Orange County uh, in Southern California. Northern California, I think, had uh, at least two, maybe more. Um, and so we had, I believe, two dozen uh, events or more that were led by local UNAs. Our events had uh, more than 100 participants. And uh, over a third of our participants were under the age of 25. I think it, it was very important that we had the voices of the young people at these events because they're talking about their future. And it was great to have their input. As many of you know, um, we, there have been consultations uh, in 30 different states, bringing together over 4,000 people and generating over 10,000 votes uh, on the My World Survey. And I think the My World Survey is an excellent place to see what the thoughts are around the world on these subjects. The consultations and votes uh, reveal a deep commitment not only to the importance of a global development agenda, but a universal one that can be applied to the U.S. as well. It's not just the developing countries, it's not just poor countries, it's our country as well. Many of you around the country are continuing the conversation on the post-2015 negotiations as you engage your communities and work with your partners to promote awareness on the sustainable goals. You know, when I'm talking to groups, I've talked to high schools, I've talked to service groups in my part of California, I often begin by saying, if you could design a better city, a better state, a better country, a better world, what would it involve? And people will say things like, well, we'd have good health care, we'd have good education. Give me some shout outs. What would we have in this ideal world? Equality. Equality. Others. Prosperity. Prosperity, jobs. Renewable energy. Renewable. We'd care for the environment, wouldn't we? Would, would we have gender equality? Yes. I think so. Um, and so I, I asked high school kids or service club members, what would you have in an ideal community? And guess what? The sustainable goals are just those things. They're where 
they are the aspects of a good place to live. And if we're going to take care of our world, we need a good place to live. So the sustainable goals are simply the world's voices coming together on what we need in the next 15 years to focus on and measure progress toward if we're going to have a better world. So I know some of us are concerned about the complexity of it all. We've got 17 goals and I think 169 targets. And that sounds like a lot of stuff. Some people have been critical of that. But if you think of what would it take for you to have a better life, for the people you love to have a better life, and for the world to have a better life, it's a lot more complex than that. So this is really just the tip of the iceberg and what we must really focus on if we're going to have a better world. So today we're going to get down uh, into the uh, actual details of how the sustainable goals came to be. How many of you know all the MDGs? All eight of them. Show me your hands. Yeah, I think most of us could name, if you can't name all eight of them, you can certainly name six or seven. So now we're going to have to transition and learn about the sustainable goals. Um, we can also talk about the process of how they're being adopted and how it relates to the climate summit as well. So what I'd like to do is um, you can refer to your handouts as we work our session. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Ambassador Cousins and then uh, she'll talk briefly and then I'll introduce Mr. Schlachter. And he'll talk briefly and then we'll have questions from the floor. It's really wonderful to have Ambassador Elizabeth Cousins here. She is the Deputy CEO of the UN Foundation. And before joining the foundation, she served as the US Ambassador to the UN Economic and Social Council and the alternative representative to the UN General Assembly between 2012 and 2014. She previously served as Principal Policy Advisor and Counselor to the Permanent Representative of the US to the UN, Susan Rice, from 2009 to 2012. In this capacity, she was the lead U.S. negotiator at the post-2015 development agenda, including representing the U.S. in the Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals. During her stint as ambassador, she led the U.S. diplomacy at the U.N. on human rights, humanitarian, social and environmental issues, served on the boards of UN agencies, funds and programs, and was the US representative to the UN Peacebuilding Peace Commission. She was also Sherpa to Ambassador Rice for the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on global sustainability. Cousins has lived around the world, serving with the UN political missions in Nepal and the Middle East and working as an analyst in conflict zones, including Bosnia and Haiti. Her prior experience includes Director of Strategy for the Human Development Center at Humanitarian Dialogue and promotes and conducts mediation of armed conflict. She was Vice President of the International Peace Institute. Uh, Dr. Cousins has a Doctor of Philosophy in International Relations from the University of Oxford. My daughter lives in London, where she was a Rhodes Scholar and a BA in History and an Honorary Doctorate from the University of Puget Sound. Please help me welcome Ambassador Cousins. Thank you very much, Mel. And thank you so much to Jill and the NEA for being such a tremendous host uh, and a great partner. And it is such a pleasure to be with you all here this morning at the 2015 uh, annual meeting of UNA USA and to see the incredible reach of UNA USA. 
At a time when the challenges we face uh, demand cooperation across borders uh, in ways they have never done uh, before, I'm convinced we need the UN more than ever before, and that means we also need you more than ever before. <clears throat> so I want to thank you very much for that warm welcome and for everything that you do. I'm thrilled to be here for this discussion uh, this morning about the post-2015 development agenda. And I want to make just a few broad points by way of scene setting uh, and before we open up the floor for discussion. First, uh, about the opportunity we have to tackle some of the world's biggest uh, global development challenges. Um, second, about some of the lessons from the Millennium Development Goal experience. Um, third, about changing global expectations. Uh, fourth, a little bit about data and evidence. Uh, and then I'll just offer a few closing thoughts about the role of civil society and especially organizations like UNA, USA. Um, so first, we have uh, truly a historic opportunity today to make decisive gains on some of the most tenacious but also solvable global development challenges. Ending extreme poverty in a generation. Tackling preventable child deaths. The prospect of an AIDS-free generation bringing modern energy services to the 1.3 billion people around the world who still live every day in the dark. These are giant potential gains that are within reach if we are able to generate sustained global cooperation and shared frameworks for mobilizing resources, expertise, uh, and ideas behind solutions. And the Millennium Development Goals taught us that setting global goals can really deliver. And we have a once in a generation opportunity this year to do that again. Second, we learned from the experience of the Millennium Development Goals a few things that we do need to do better. For example, when problems are linked, like the nexus between food, water, and energy, the solutions need to be linked to. This is the whole issue of silos and not silos. We learned that the quality of outcomes matters as much as the quantity of outcomes and that we need to take them seriously. So not just getting all kids into school, but making sure that they learn. We're learning, we learned a lot also about the limitations of addressing symptoms rather than causes, and I think we learned that statistics can mask exclusion and that we need to pay much more attention to the people and communities who can get left behind or left out of development gains. Now third, we are living in a very different world than when the MDGs were created 15 years ago and expectations have risen considerably. When the MDGs were agreed in 2000 with a clock that would count down by this year, they focused around, as all of you know better than I do, around a few big issues on the anti-poverty agenda, especially hunger, health, and education, and the poorest of the poor. And they mainly focused on how to target official development assistance around those problems. If you fast forward 15 years, the world has changed in profound uh, and dizzying ways. There has been tremendous dynamism, growth, and assertion in the developing world. And in fact, that's really the story of how hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of extreme poverty over the last generation, is growth in those countries and economies. Um, there is also a growing recognition and a mounting recognition that we need to address environmental sustainability, including climate change, or our development gains will be very short-lived, uh, and that all of us need to tackle issues like rising inequality uh, and social exclusion. And there's also a growing and new appreciation for all the flows of investment be beyond and in addition to official development assistance can, that can be mobilized for development, from domestic resources uh, in developing countries to direct foreign investment to philanthropy. Now that means we do have an opportunity today for a next generation development agenda that focuses on some truly transformative and enduring solutions. Now fourth, um, we have uh, an even more informed basis for making the judgments we do about what priorities we want to set than we did 15 years ago. Uh, we have accumulated substantial data and evidence about what produces development outcomes, about what works and what doesn't, and that means we have an opportunity to make this generation of our development goals um, truly evidence-driven. Now that's part of the reason, I think, why we've seen some surprising cross-regional coalitions among countries grow around some of the issues that have historically been incredibly sensitive in general and especially in a development context. Issues like sustained and inclusive growth, 
which now commands a kind of robust and wide-ranging support as being something central to our development agenda. Issues of peace and governance, issues of women's equality and empowerment. Um, they're still very sensitive, but the fact that there's a weight of evidence showing how much these matter in so many different contexts to development has helped create um, the kind of cross-regional support that I think is why you see them now in the proposal for uh, new sustainable development goals. The evidence base in these areas is just absolutely incontrovertible that these are bottleneck issues and that they have to be addressed as a matter of urgency um, in order to get the development we seek. So let me just um, make three very brief concluding thoughts. Um, the first is really obvious, but I think it's worth emphasizing that what we're trying to do here with the post-2015 development agenda with the SDGs is something we have never done before. We're trying to get 193 countries, multitudes of experts, citizens, activists, stakeholders of a variety of kinds from every sector to come together around a common agenda and embrace it as something they genuinely own and want to act on, and to do that at a time of unprecedented global dynamism and change. Um, that's pretty extraordinary. Um, it may turn out to be crazy, but I think it's kind of crazy in a wonderful way. Um, that creates significant new opportunities to mobilize a range of new resources around development, new wealth, new actors, new citizen engagement, new forms of citizen engagement powered by new technologies, even as it generates challenges. That's just a tremendous new field in which we're operating. And as I mentioned, I mean, the MDGs, when they were created in the year 2000, it was a very different world. The second point um, uh, I would make is about implementation and learning. So we have three major milestone events on the international calendar this year that you're all familiar with. Um, the first up in July is a conference on financing for development in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. It's the third follow-on to the Monterey Conference on Financing for Development from 2002. There's the summit on SDGs in September that will be in New York. And then, of course, there's a conference of parties on climate change in Paris in November and December. But whatever we agree this year in those three critical moments, the real question is what happens the day after. The real question is what happens when capitals, when ministries, when cities, communities, schools, educators, etc., start to think about implementation. What's relevant to them and what actions do they want to take? And possibly the most important thing we can do um, at this moment in time and as we go forward is to figure out how to give ourselves scope over the next 15 years to adapt and innovate in relation to what we're learning about the experience of implementation, to learn from each other, to learn from our own experience. And the third and last point is about civil society. We have seen really an incredible and extraordinary engagement of civil society and publics in various forms over the course of this debate. Uh, and there is much more civil society engagement at the UN in New York than I've certainly ever seen in my career working in and around New York. It's still not enough, but it's phenomenally greater than it's ever been. And UNA USA, you have, can make, I think, a particular contribution um, to this debate. Um, you know the United States deeply well. You know the UN well, and you can help raise awareness uh, in all quarters about issues like the post-2015 development agenda, what's relevant about it, and how the UN can really be, as it's turning out to be, an unparalleled convening platform for global cooperation among all stakeholders uh, at its best. So I will conclude there and look very forward to hearing from Mark and uh, to your questions and to discussion. Thanks so much. Isn't that wonderful? We've got the lead negotiator on this whole process right with us, and I look forward to uh, sharing questions uh, with them. Um, our second uh, panel member today is Mark Schlachter, and Mark is the director of the Office of Public Affairs and Outreach at the U.S. State Department. He's been with the State Department for 25 years. And most of that time was spent in the Foreign Service, most of that in Africa, including stints in Tanzania, Cameroon, South Africa, Uganda, Senegal, Guinea, where he had also served in the Peace Corps back in the late 80s. Um, Mark attended the University of Colorado. Do we have any buffaloes in the group? There we go. <laughs> He also has a master's in public administration from the Monterey Institute. 
So he comes with a great pedigree. Uh, I asked him some of the highlights of his career, uh, and he said uh, one of them was learning different languages. He speaks two African languages, Fulani and Swahili. One of the uh, not so highlights was he was in Tanzania when the embassy was blown up in the late 90s. So it's my pleasure to introduce, introduce Mark. Let's give him a warm UNA welcome. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark. I came for breakfast. And here I am. I'm very pleased to be with you. It was not in my expectation to give remarks today, so I won't. But let me just say a couple things to uh, get us started and maybe uh, invite some, some questions. Um, I am engaged full-time in public outreach for the State Department, which is, comes with its range of challenges. But one of the areas in which we have been most productive over the last couple of years is working with you folks. And I think we've had the pleasure of inter intersecting in, in some of your regions over the last year to talk about post-2015, about what the SDGs mean, could mean, should mean. And eliciting input, feedback, and submissions from your communities. And I'll say that that's important for two, two very real reasons. It's important for people, people like Ambassador Cousins to hear what the actual concerns are from civil, civil society, what our aspirations are at the community level. But from my perspective, from an outreach perspective, it's crucial to be able to reflect to the rest of the world that the American public is engaged in this effort, that the American public is interested in the outcomes of this process, and that we are not uh, parties above and beyond, but we are, we are parties to this conversation. And you can imagine that for the United States, uh, particularly over the last 15, 20 years, that's sometimes a difficult sell on the international stage, where we are oftentimes interpreted as, ha as having a unilateral objective in all circumstances. We all know that that's not true, but in many cases that's a, that is a difficult uh, sale to make. So I want to express my appreciation to you for participating in those activities and to continue participating so that we can continue to reflect your opinions and your views and your values on the international stage and make sure that our voices, our collective American voices, are very much party to this conversation. So that's all I wanted to say. I have nothing to add to what Ambassador Cousins said because that would be stupid. But I do uh, I want to make myself available to talk particularly to those folks in the room who are interested in, in careers in international affairs because this is an extremely interesting time to be uh, in the business, as we say. And I say that because we are entering what is truly a multilateral age uh, for all diplomats of all nationalities. And this crowd, uh, this community, this organization gives you folks uh, very important insights on how that works. And I encourage that interest because we need a generation of multilateral diplomats who will lead the United States in those conversations over the next 25 years. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We're going to turn on these microphones. Ambassador Cousins, uh, let's see if this works. Good. Ambassador Cousins and Mark, if you'll just uh, share that microphone in response to some questions we're going to have. Uh, and everyone out in the audience, uh, we will have microphones in just a few minutes. I wanted to ask a couple of preliminary questions. Um, one of them is, uh, are the proposed sustainable goals a done deal? Are they wrapped and finished and they're just going to go through a rubber stamp in September? Uh, or are they, do we expect any significant changes from uh, the Secretary General's synthesis, uh, synthesis report uh, that was issued in December? Take that. Sorry, I was really started. Um, so this is uh, this is a matter of great debate and uh, great great speculation. Um, the proposal that's on the table that's being uh, negotiated now is a proposal that arose out of a year and a half long process out of something called the Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals, in which um, virtually every country in the United Nations was represented. It was a kind of funny process. It grew out of the Rio Plus Twenty uh, conference. That's what launched it. And countries were configured into teams, but it was essentially a very open, inclusive process. It involved also a lot of consultations with civil society, with the private sector, etc. As a result of that, the proposal that emerged has a tremendous amount of, um, of buy-in from a lot of stakeholders. It's still just a proposal. 
It's still part of the negotiations that are underway right now in New York leading to the summit, where there are other things also being discussed about a political declaration that could really be a kind of call to arms around development, uh, questions about what the monitoring and review and accountability framework might be around, uh, around goals that are agreed. Um, and there is still openness to looking at the goals and the targets that are part of that proposal. There's been, as I say, quite a lot of debate around it. Um, but there's also, as I say, also a lot of buy-in. Not every aspect of that proposal was agreed. I can say that very honestly as one of the negotiators involved with it. I think a preponderance of what's in there is agreed, but there are some issues on which different countries um, agree to disagree, but they wanted to put the proposal forward as genuinely the best that they could arrive at over this long process. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's anybody's guess, <laughs> um, but I would, uh, I, would, I would probably place my bets around 17 goals. Great. Um, Speaking of uh, individual country uh, influence, are there specific parts of the sustainable goals that kind of bear your um, fingerprints uh, as the lead American negotiator? Are there parts that stayed in or didn't make it that bear your signature? Is this where I say I could tell you would it have to kill you? <laughs> 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 well, um, <clears throat> no, I think what, what was really, uh, I must say, tremendously inspiring uh, and energizing about this whole this whole process and the privilege of being involved with it was that it was it was a learning process for every single delegate that was part of it. I can genuinely say, I mean, we met in the open chamber, and all of you and others would have been part of it. We met a lot in the basement at the UN, where they were smaller configurations, and we really struggled. I mean, we recognized the differences that we are, there are between countries, certainly interests, perspectives, and so on. But in my view, there really was a genuine effort to come together and bridge differences that were extremely difficult. So, for example, uh, goal 16 on peaceful and inclusive societies. I mentioned it a minute ago. There is a tremendous weight of evidence that you cannot get meaningful development outcomes unless you actually are able to have a modicum of peace and institutions that are reasonably representative of all stakeholders in society and institutions that work. Uh, huge amounts of evidence. But to introduce questions of peace and governance into a development conversation is controversial for a lot of countries. And so that was a real struggle for quite, uh, for quite a lot of delegates. But we managed to come up with, I think, quite a strong uh, uh, goal uh, with a proposed set of targets that go to all of those issues. That it even includes um, issues about fundamental rights and freedom, issues of corruption, access to justice, by the way, also an issue for us here. So um, I think there was just a genuine, uh, a genuine commitment to try to forge common ground among delegations, and that to me was, was really powerful. So in a way, all our fingerprints are on all of it. I can tell you the pieces that I feel a little bit less comfortable with, but you know there are there are you, you all of it's a matter of uh, of uh, good faith uh, negotiation and trying to reach some reasonable reasonable compromises. One of the things we're going to be doing as a group is uh, speaking to the Congress and uh, staffers tomorrow. I wondered if either of you had comments about uh, some of the messaging we'll be taking to Congress. Uh, are there parts of this regarding the funding or regarding the goals themselves that we should emphasize? And uh, what is the role of the Congress in relationship to what state will be doing and uh, what, what can happen in September and later this year? Thanks, appreciate the easy one, Mel, that's great. <laughs> okay, well, you're all going up to see how many meetings, 200 meetings over the next few days with staff. At least. It's fantastic. It's a, really, it's, a, it's a crucial opportunity for you to make some points, and, and if you'll get your pens and pencils out, I'll make, I'll make sure you get the points out. Um, what I'd really like you guys to say, if you were going to say, speak on behalf of the department, is that the U.S. has to be a leading voice in this exercise, has to continue being a leading voice in this exercise. Now, you all know that you're, gonna, you're going to meet with some skepticism in certain corners of Congress. We certainly feel that vibe on, on some of these issues on a daily basis. But it's important to reflect back to the MDGs uh, for your congressional context, uh, context and remind them what an instructive role the United States played in that exercise and continues to play in the SDG exercise as we work toward what will be a revolutionary approach to, to aid and, and our aspirations associated there. So we at the State Department are working with congressional contacts to, to introduce them to the idea of this collaborative process as not a threat to U.S. interests, 
but as a means of extending U.S. influence and U.S. values. That's a bit of a tough sell. But I invite you to participate in that exercise because I think that's what we all believe here: is that this is uh, this is an aspiration that is globalized, and that we need to internalize it as a as a domestic reality as well. So, uh, good luck with that. It's, <laughs> it's not an easy message, message to offer, but I would encourage you to, to make a shot at that. That's good. Fully agree. Endorsed. That's great. Um, let's open it to the floor, and if you have a question, please raise your hand, and the microphone will come to you. Uh, please say who you are, uh, hold the microphone close, and keep it brief. <laughs> right here in the middle. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Karen Mulhauser with the National Capital Area. Uh, chapter and um, I, I want to do a little bit of a shameless plug. I first met Jill when she came to our Model UN conference at the State Department. So I want to thank Mark because he facilitates that for our chapter. They have a Model UN conference every year. But my question is to Ambassador Cousins and um, the among the 17 goals, there's one, as you acknowledged, to, to gender equality. And gender equality is mainstream throughout the other goals as well. And I, um, my question is, because this is also the 15th uh, anniversary of Security Council Resolution 1325 on Peace, Women and Peace, and my anniversary of Beijing, is how important do you think that reference to gender equality is to all of the other um, goals. Thank you. Should we take these one at a time for now? Yes, please. <clears throat> well, profoundly, I think, is in, in, in a word. Um, to me, one of the most important, uh, all of the goals are important, but one of the most profound and impactful is that goal five on women's equality and empowerment. And as you say, the places elsewhere in the agenda where there are also very powerful targets related to women's equality. For example, access to productive assets and property rights and inheritance. Um, what was also very striking to me, and again, I think this is about the world shifting and it's about evidence and a lot of other things, a standalone goal on gender equality and empowerment was the very first one to command public broad-based support. In these negotiations and discussions, people were very nervous about starting to say, I want this goal or that goal. So there's a lot of kind of general soundings, discussions, and no one wanted to move first. The one that moved first was this one. You had a group of countries across regions, the United States was one of them, uh, that said, this is too important to be shy about. <laughs> so let's be serious, let's start with it, um, and let's make the targets that are underneath it really powerful and concrete. So issues that are not necessarily easy for everybody, issues of uh, equal, equal political participation and voice, issues of economic empowerment, obviously issues of violence against women uh, and girls, uh, sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights, um, productive assets and property rights, as I mentioned. So very serious uh, 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 elements that really create a foundation for quite impactful work on women's equality and empowerment and the situation of girls and adolescents as well. Thank you for the question. Mark, do you want to add to that? Negative. Thank you. We'll take another question in the back, please. Zed, um, in 1994, our delegation to the Cairo conference was strong. They were leaders, they were advocates, they were champions, and led the world, including the Vatican and others, to a consensus document. I sense that our government is slipping back from being champions to basically sort of voting the right way. And we've got the upcoming Finance for Development, where it seems the two processes are merging together. And I think we really need you to be strong champions and out there the way you were in the 1990s. And can you tell us sort of what the thinking is? Are you pulling back on sexual and reproductive health and rights? Is there a pulling back on women's rights? I mean, um, Ambassador, you did say that this is con women's rights were sort of controversial. And I guess, what can we expect from the US government in terms of truly being out there as our advocates, our champions, and being in front of the line, not in back, both at the financing meeting and at the upcoming meeting in September? 
Would you tell us uh, who you are and sure. where you're from? Sure. My name's Kathy Dunk, and I'm with CCMC. I'll be on the panel a little bit later. Thank you. The controversy isn't in the United States. I mean, that I think you can't fault, um, and I'll just speak to my history, and then I'll leave to speak to the present, but during the time that I served um, with the U.S. mission to the U.N. since 2009, I don't think there was an issue uh, at a moment or a single occasion on which we were anything other than strong champions of exactly the issues that you described. Uh, I bear a lot of scars from a lot of those debates. The sensitivity is not in the United States, it's that in a, in a number of countries, some of the elements of this agenda are sensitive. And so that's where the, and they're, they're old debates, they're not ones that are, that are unfamiliar. Um, but they're often the ones that are at the very 11th hour of any negotiation, the ones on which you're really trying to reconcile differences. Um, but I can certainly testify to our effort to, uh, to have been making from the very beginning and in every possible way, um, women's rights uh, and empowerment, sexual reproductive health and reproductive rights, I mean, one of the, one of the, um, uh, the most important priorities that we have at the UN. Yes, I, um, I agree with the uh, course, and I will say that the sort of state of play is very much as you described, Kathy, and that conversion that you're talking about is coming. It's making those conversations even more complicated and more uh, prone to those sort of uh, visited issues. Uh, I will say, as an atmospheric on the issue of gender and related issues, that there isn't a meeting of uh, this group either the FFT negotiating parties or the SDG work groups that doesn't feature that conversation, and particularly in the context of how do we identify where the fault lines are and then how do we cross those lines and protect and advance for where we have been and where we want to go. So uh, that is very, very much a feature of these, of, these, of these planning processes. Now that said, I would suggest that there is ample space, ample space remains for the Kathy Box of the world to make their voices heard and, and indicate that, that there is there is consistent, sustained attention to these issues, and that doesn't occur. Great. Let's have a question from a student, please, a young person. <laughs> yeah, one. We've got either of these up front. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ashmi Desai. I am a doctoral student at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, my question is also about the sustainable development goals. Um, as a doctoral student, my research is based in Central India. I'm looking at media representations of a Maoist movement in India. So I see a lot of these goals uh, and identify them as issues that I've looked on the ground in the field. However, a lot of these issues are also connected with indigenous rights and um, then not getting representation in government and uh, you know, getting a voice. Um, in Colorado, close to Colorado, I've seen uh, what has happened um, in Arizona where you know, the Maho have their own government and have been given their own, um, you know, a, a chance to have their three levels of governance um, come about. So I was thinking, did the language of indigenous rights come about in the discussion of millennium and the new set of um, SDGs? And what is what is the dialogue and discussion about this? Thank you. I'll just make, um, make two. It's a very, very good question, an important question. Um, it's certainly, the, the issue of indigenous peoples and indigenous rights came up throughout throughout the, the discussions um, and debates. I and mean, then you'll see actually reference to indigenous peoples in different targets throughout the document. Um, I think the other broad point that I would make, I mean, you've heard the phrase, leave no one behind. Um, from the very beginning of this conversation, it was very clear that as a kind of moral compass throughout our conversations was a commitment to lifting the floor for the most vulnerable identifying where the most vulnerable are so that then you can also target strategies and assistance and support to them. And what goes along with that is a parallel call for data and for disaggregation of data. We have so many data deficits uh, in so many places, um, and one of them goes to the question of where people are the most vulnerable and being able to find that out so that it goes to the question of women's and gender equality, it goes to issues of indigenous uh, communities. Um, so I think um, that's one of the most powerful tools we will have to be very serious and impactful around um, uh, 
support for indigenous communities. So thank you for the question. Troy, if we could have another young person on your side, and then we'll come to this side. Thank you. Uh, James Moir from uh, Mission State University of Chapman. Uh, my question is to either of you, I guess whoever wants to tackle it. Um, as we're talking about sustainability, of course, we have to address growth. Um, I'm a big fan of Timothy Jackson's prosperity type growth. Um, along with Evan Neo Malthusian, uh, he brings up a lot of good points, and, and I'm just wondering what has the U.S. And the UN, in collaboration or separately, done to try to limit growth or limit at least the growth focused uh, economic basis that we receive through things. I got another. <laughs> Top, these are tough questions. You know, I think part of what is very striking about this whole conversation we've had to date, and one we will need to have after this most kind of consequential of years, is that there are no, there are no. There are no perfect answers to these questions. These are matters of deep policy debate. They're matters of debate about evidence, debate about values, and that's not going to go away just when we set goals. I mean, that's going to be part of the experience of implementing goals that are that will play itself out very differently in different communities, in different countries, even in different sectors. So I think um, we did have a lot of debate about um, inclusive economic growth, about growth models. Obviously, there are a lot of different growth models out there in the world. Um, uh, and we didn't, I think, resolve them. We did resolve that uh, that you really can't do much poverty eradication without some economic growth. And I think there is broad-based understanding of that. Uh, but how that takes place, in what ways, that's a matter for um, people like you to get involved and stay involved uh, in implementation. And by the way, I hope you don't take your, your litmus test of youth up to the panel. I'm getting very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> question over here and I'll also uh, tell the young people in the audience that uh, we may use Mark's uh, presence up front uh, for questions about how did how do you get into a career in foreign service so it's not exactly our topic but he's a good guy to ask that question we'll take a question over here please yes hi Elizabeth Weinberg San Francisco chapter um, thank you for the panel today uh, my uh, question is sort of a, a, a thought and a question. I, um, as we did several rounds of consultations out in California uh, through the My World, we, we had the consultations, we looked at the goals, and we selected goals. I found a really interesting thing happen for me as I was trying to select goals, and that was that the um, goals like freedom from persecution, corruption, Things like that were competing uh, with food, water, um, and I had a really difficult time choosing because uh, you know climate change and some of the, the goals are really. There was a shift in my own consciousness as I was as I was trying to select, and I wondered if that was something that had happened in your conversation. Is if you're finding because in the Western world we don't have to deal on a day to day basis with a lot of the. Um, Issues like that's part of the shift from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable. The Sustainable are designed for all, um, and so we're not dealing with maybe not having water every day. But at the same time, I felt my shift of consciousness and really feeling that you know living under persecution um, is just as uh, oppressing as living in a in a difficult situation is just as pressing as maybe not having water. So I had a difficult time choosing. I just wonder if that was something that was happening um, across the board and if that was something that came up in your discussion discussions through the State Department and through the selection of the goals. Thank you. Um, just, just a couple of thoughts to another great, great um, question. I think um, there is an overall challenge of the, the tension, managing the tension between um, the breadth of this agenda and the issues it seeks to cover and setting priorities. And that's, to be honest, that wouldn't go away even if there were 10 goals on the table instead of 17. Even with the MDGs, as lean as they were with eight, people had to make choices about where to start, what to prioritize with them. So I think um, that that challenge of setting priorities is something we all face in all kinds of different ways. Um, what I saw reflected, however, was um, two things. I think first, a recognition that take the issues you raised uh, about water scarcity or water use and governance. Um, they're actually not unrelated. In a lot of places, they're deeply related. 
And so questions about access to water and how it's, how it's uh, allocated, how it's used, go to a lot of fundamental questions about government. So you can't really always disconnect them. Uh, that's one. And the second was, I think, a you know, walk and chew gum at the same time. We shouldn't be having to make choices between fundamental human rights and governance uh, and issues like access to water and sanitation. I'll just add a thought there because I, I had a chance to go through some of the data points that we collected from around the world regarding civil society's feedback and input of the process. And, and I would say that your experience was very similar to the experience that we collected from every corner of the world where people really struggle with this idea of what the law is where and where, are the, where does one law lead into the other and, and how do we come to terms with defining the down to a consumable goal. So it, I'm sure it was a shared experience throughout this room. We'll have a question here in the center section, please. First one to get the microphone, that's great. Thanks very much. First of all, I want to congratulate you for leading a transparent process of keeping the beauty of the complexity in place during the last year and a half. That is really quite extraordinary. The outcome is extraordinary. Um, now comes the challenge of some nitpicking, both within our US government and also in the new process of trying to find measurable outcomes that can be stated before this is voted upon. I wanted you to comment about that. In one, in one sense, um, our president, the acting head of AID, um, and actually not other people, have ever talked about the beauty of the complexity. They keep talking about just poverty alleviation, and of course we're going to be there, but don't seem to be enthusiastic about talking about the entire um, thoughtful process now to go forward, and uh, that worries me because it, it, it will reflect on Capitol Hill that even the administration who supported this may not be supporting it. And second, in, the, um, in New York now there's this next set of discussions in which people are trying to measure the goals or set measurements, and people are beginning to say if you can't measure it or it isn't stated as a measurable outcome, then it won't actually become part of this package that could undermine a number of the women's rights issues, could undermine quite a number of the other goals. Is that so, or how do you see that ongoing negotiation? And what can we in NEA do, in, in NEA, in UNA and NEA, uh, do to ensure that neither of these things happens, undermining by our own government, and uh, a change in the wonderful, uh, broad presentation that uh, you, you fostered to get us to this point? Thank I'm you. Steve Mosley from the NCA chapter here, thank you. Thank you, Karen. I was just going to ask Steve who he is. <laughs> and uh, after we get an answer to this question, we'll have uh, another question up front here on this side, and then we'll go up front on the other side, Troy. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Let me just uh, start by saying that that was a very well uh, encapsulated statement slash question. I think you captured some of the tensions that we see and that are sort of uh, leaking out from the, from the origins. We, don't, we haven't been particularly successful about talking government about where our priorities uh, and where our outcomes, where our desired outcomes are signed. We're working on that. As you can imagine, and as you've summarized, there are many, many, many interests, and those interests sometimes overlap. So it's a, it's a challenge for us, that we've proved it. but we are getting there, and as the process finds new clarity and the negotiation is really in a fever pitch, you're going to see us occupying some very positive public space on Can I just add two, two thoughts on that? First, on nitpicking. Nitpicking's great. We should all welcome nitpicking. We need, I mean, we're going to need this now. We're going to need it over the next 15 years. This goes to the point about learning that I made. We need constant critique, scrutiny, debate. I mean, that, that, that shouldn't stop just because you set a set of goals. So to me, that's to be welcomed, whether it's on the minutes or, or, or more, more the fundamentals. Um, the second is on measurement. I think one of the important things to keep in mind is that even if we are not able to measure certain things well now, by setting a target that demands measurement, it will drive innovation in methodologies and metrics and, and data collection. So I, I think one needs to be very careful, partic careful particularly around some of the issues that you raised, where we may not have the best metrics now, but that doesn't mean we can't get them. And part of the purpose of putting them there is for that. I think we have to recognize that this is hard stuff to measure. Um, you know, you can put a lot of economists and statisticians, statisticians in the room, they won't all agree. And that's something that we're going to keep working on and try to refine and get alignment around. But it, to my mind, doesn't have to be done by September in order to be worth doing. It's part of the ongoing task. We only have a few minutes left, so please be brief. 
Hello, my name is Jenny from Pasadena, California. I'm an advocate specifically for the disabled, and I've been waiting for the SGDs to come out. July 26 marks the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. As of 2010, we had 56.7 million people in the United States, and as we age, many of us will become disabled persons. Now, the SGDs were meant to focus and bring the exclusivity to the disabled. When I was looking and reviewing, I found number four, inclusive and equitable education, inclusive economic growth and protection for employment, equal pay for equal work. Currently in the United States, under the Section 14C Fair Labor Standards Act, it discriminates against the disabled, allowing an employer to pay them a fraction of minimum wage. This is done by many organizations, including Goodwill Industries, Salvation Army, where they pay 50 cents to $2 an hour. Only 5% of the 400,000 disabled individuals would even qualify as not doing the fair work or fair pay. Jennifer, may we have your question? Where is it explicitly written the protection for the disabled and the equality to ensure that although we fail our disabled, we will not in the SGDs? I mean, the, the larger point to me, I mean, we, there was a lot of discussion about, about uh, this as well, and uh, I have a family, it's a very personal issue for me and my family, so I, I very much appreciate the question. Um, what is underpinning this entire agenda is this commitment to leave no one behind, to disaggregate the metrics around every single thing that we're trying to do around communities that are the most vulnerable, of which uh, 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 the disabled are among those who are often the most left out of development gains in many countries and, and contexts. So to me, it's actually a very powerful tool that this gives to people like you and to advocates for the dis disabled to be able to, to advance their interests and their rights. I mean, there's a significant um, uh, and important language about human rights in, in Goal 16 in particular. Um, so to me, there's actually a, quite a lot in this agenda that speaks precisely to, to, to the issues you bring. Mark, do you want to add anything? Negative. Okay, uh, let's uh, try and get some young voices in our questions. You can ask the next question, sir. I'm not that young, but okay. <laughs> okay. I, guess, I guess that's all relative. Um, my name is Gabe Levitt, and I'm the president of the UNA Brooklyn chapter. And um, I want to go back to metrics, but without, but without belaboring that point, I understand that having these high aspirations, uh, particularly number one, to end poverty in all of its forms, an attempt to bring great minds and great intellectual debate to even what that means, because now we have more of the kind of technol technological ability to achieve it. But literally two blocks from my house, there is a lot of poverty right here in the United States, one. And two, when some of us go up to our, um, uh, um, when we meet with our elected officials, and they say, what does it mean that we are going to end poverty in all of its forms? What do you guys just think is the best answer to that question to kind of build support for that type of eventual brain trust to put towards that pro problem to, to develop those measures? I think what I would encourage you to do is look in this look below the goal level at the targets because there was more specificity in the targets. So, for example, the um, raising people above a dollar twenty-five a day, or whatever, and, as well as um, uh, countries really thinking uh, thinking seriously about what it takes to raise a percentage of their own population above their national poverty floor, whatever that is. So that's a step to the second target in the whole agenda. So, in, in principle, this should be a tool for countries and communities to ask themselves exactly that question. Um, how do we tackle, what are the most important dimensions of poverty to tackle in our context? It's not going to be the same in every place. And so this should be a tool for communities, governments, citizens, to be able to mobilize around to answer that question and then to start to look at actions that they can take against those objectives. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just note that the important reason that ended up being is number one on the list of 
evolving roles because it reflects the fact that there was work to be done from the NDGs. There were great accomplishments, and yet on that particular issue, we have a long way to go. So if your community leaders are asking you, well, what does that look like? You can point to the NDGs over the last 15 years and indicate that there's a, there's a very impressive timeline of progress there that remains incomplete. And if there's an endpoint there, then I think it's, it's projected in that trend line. We have a question in the back. And uh, this will be the next to the last question, and we'll have one more up front here. And we'll end with the young person up front. But next question. I'm Shima from Monterey Chapter. My question is for Mark. Hold the microphone closer. Closer. Uh, I'm Shima from Monterey Chapter. Um, my question is for Mark, and you talked about public, uh, American needs to be uh, aware of these issues, and sometimes it's very difficult to make them feel related in these local chapters with these global issues. And what do you think is the best approach? You know, we host an event, when we have lawyers, we outreach, we do all of that, and it's very hard to get a really even small group of people, uh, 50, let's say 100 even, uh, to show up and even feel related or just be educated about this 17, let's say, even two of them or some of them. Yeah, that's a, that's a terrible challenge. We face that every day. How do we create sustained an audience for issues that may not be doorstep issues for most Americans. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is we partner with UNA and uh, other civil society organizations to, to share a platform and to create linkages that haven't existed before. I think we've done a good job in that regard the last year, but let me make this offer to you. You folks are all engaged and connected in your communities. We, at the same moment, want to be engaged with you. And we're available to you in ways I think many of you wouldn't necessarily appreciate. I mean, don't appreciate it, maybe you would appreciate it. Um, and we're available to you to talk to your communities and to come out and discuss this process, the NDGs, and what the next uh, few years look like in terms of engagement with the United Nations. So that's one of the ways we can do that. We can give you some, some support in that regard that maybe helps you draw that up. Last question. Hello, good morning. My name is Brandon Holmes, and I'm from UWR Strauss. I study international studies, national global security and African studies. Um, I have a pretty straightforward question. I was thinking, um, could you guys explain the importance of having uh, states in the Middle East and also small island developing states support and also give you guys information in regards to the SDGs and promoting and implementing implementing the agenda? Go ahead, I answered your question quite correctly. How do we better engage the Pacific Small Island states? Yes, like how do you gain information and how do you go about gaining support from like small island developing nations? Oh, from like small island developing nations, especially in regards to like climate change or Middle Eastern countries in regards to gender equality. How do we measure it in these developing countries? No, this, so to me, I mean, this is your question goes to the heart of what has been exciting and also challenging in this intergovernmental process that we've had to reach agreement around goals. So one of the kind of the leaders in uh, all of the discussions around climate change and also some of the oceans issues at the UN were the Pacific Small Island Developing States. Um, uh, the United States works very closely with them, but so they command tremendous uh, respect and leadership in the UN because for them, as they rightly say, these are existential issues. And so when they speak about climate change or they speak about issues, they a tremendous amount of weight, um, and it really influences uh, other countries to get together around a common agenda. It happens to be one that they very much share deeply with the United States. On the Middle East, um, also, I think every issue uh, has cross-regional partners and coalitions. Uh, it changes, and sometimes there are, there are hard issues to debate, so with some colleagues in some regions, we have very different views um, about issues of women's rights, for example. Um, but it's, it's patient, it's devious, it's all the work of trying to persuade people about, about how to make change in their society. And what I have been most heartened by is how much, I think, um, colleagues from around the world actually do, broadly speaking, want the same things for their families, for their communities, for their citizens. They may have different constraints, they may have different ways of understanding how to do that, but on balance, people want their kids to get an education, they want their families to be healthy, they want to get jobs at the end of the day, and they want to live in an environment that's reasonably healthy and that preserves their natural resources. So when you start there, I think you at least have things you can work on, even if you don't agree every day. 
Thank you. Uh, we want to thank Ambassador Cousins and particularly thanks to Mark for uh, pinch hitting for Daniela on short notice. Let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you. I think uh, Shante will tell us our next sessions, which are.